using the immediate context to ultimately arrive at the correct meaning of a text. When we're studying a specific passage or a specific text, we need to think hard and long about the value of using the immediate context to ultimately arrive at the correct meaning of a text. I've already put this kind of uh, on the table uh, with the opening discussions about Jeremiah 29.11 and Philippians 4.13 as to the value of the immediate context. Um, simply want to reinforce it for a second and then really get about practicing more of it. But to reinforce the point, I mean, just think of why we must pay attention to the verses surrounding each text. If I make this statement, it's the most beautiful place in the world, what am I talking about? Texas. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Right? I mean, we have no idea. You know, I mean, you're going to, as you should, kind of go, well, well, come on. If you don't mean Texas, we'll, we'll escort you out of here. Um, <laughs> you just don't have a clue. If you heard, if you just took that statement and then you at least knew, like I said it, maybe you could begin to guess, like maybe, is, maybe he thinks the Rocky Mountains are the most beautiful. Maybe that's why he lives in Colorado. I don't know. You know, more, more information would allow you to figure that out. Um, it's like I have a, a, a buddy of mine, you know, who, uh, has, who has a statement that he says, normally yelling it in different situations, and it goes like this. Ain't no thing but a chicken wing! And uh, when I hear that statement, I don't know what you think it means, but I know exactly what it means when this guy Dan says it. It's basically like proclaiming, I'm about to do something stupid. It occurs right before jumping off a cliff, you know, right before a series of backflips, you know, off of, you know, while snowboarding. It, you just know that means get ready, watch this, it's going to hurt. Um, you know, it, it's, I mean, but, but it could mean all sorts of things based on who uses it and when and where and what just came before and what normally happens when you hear those words. So we, it, you know, what you don't find is what I've put there in your notes and is, is a paragraph like this that reads, I heard an interesting story on the news the other night. The quarterback faded back to pass carbon buildup was keeping the carburetor from functioning properly. The two-inch stakes were burned on the outside, but raw on the inside. Ten feet high snowdrifts blocked the road. The grass needed mowing. The elevator raced to the top of the 100-story building in less than a minute. The audience, the audience boos the poor performance. I mean, unless your local news is really bad, you've never heard anything like that. I mean, it wouldn't... But... <clears throat> When we just take out little parts of the Bible and run with them, okay, we are operating from a perspective of that is, a, in fact, what happens. We are treating the Bible like it is a bunch of unrelated string of statements of which we go in and find a clear one, pull it out, we call it a nugget, our golden nugget, our nugget of truth. We call it whatever we want, uh, and, and, then we, and then we take it with, and we plug it in wherever we want, and the meaning kind of changes based on what we're thinking or feeling at the moment. So that's not how communication works, and so we don't want to approach the Bible that way. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've given you the opportunity here to define the word context. Uh, I think I've defined it earlier, but just to, to give you a general definition of it in terms of what I'm thinking when I say immediate context, the context, generic reference to this, the setting or larger environment in which something is placed the setting or larger environment in which something is placed. Technically, when we're referring to the immediate context, uh, sc scholars like to use a different word, just because when you're a scholar, you, you know, make a name for yourself when you make up words. 
And so uh, it's becoming more common to use the expression cotext instead of immediate or surrounding context. And uh, there's some folks that are trying to say, no, when you say context, let's think historical context. When you think cotext, let's think the language around, uh, you know, the words around um, a, a given passage. So I, I, I may see either, I may say either one, you may see either expression, surrounding context, immediate context, or the cotext. Again, in general, it's just the setting in which something is placed. Cotext really uh, is referring to the written material uh, that comes just before and just after any given passage, and that's what goes in the blanks there for question number one on what is the immediate context of a Bible passage. Well, it refers to the relationship of a passage to the material just before and just after it. You see a reference in your notes to uh, an expression surrounding context that is used in a textbook that I use. I unfortunately was not allowed to assign you to read the 20 chapters from that textbook before this morning. But uh, uh, if you're wondering wh what it is, I've actually listed kind of my top 10 books on how to interpret the Bible, uh, created some kind of book list. If you're a user of Goodreads, goodreads.com, there's applications for your f phones and devices and all of that. Um, but have a list of kind of what I consider to be my top 10 books, and one of them is the textbook that I uh, use uh, each time I teach a class on biblical interpretation, which is called Grasping God's Word. It's, uh, I'm trying to think, it's in its second or third edition at this point because it's been so popular, so well received, and often used. So, Grasping God's Word by two gentlemen named Duval and Hayes. Um, uh, but uh, that book, again, takes you through in a more extended fashion what we're doing in a very uh, quick and highlighted fashion uh, here in this day and a half. Why is it important to pay attention to the immediate context? I think at this point that question's answered. So if you just want to feel good by filling in the blank to repeat, context controls meaning. Robertson McQuilkin was always well known for saying, context is king. Uh, you know, if you can find a way to have all three words start with the k sound, just let me know, because that alliteration would be appreciated. Um, communication, it always occurs inside a context. You pay attention to it, you figure out the flow of thought, you'll figure out the current theme, and it will allow you to determine the meaning of individual passages. Right, we've already done the work on Philippians 4.13, so we'll skip that one, which is there in your notes, because you've already figured it out that the things Paul's referring to is good and bad circumstances. So let's move on to a passage that's less familiar before going back to some familiar passages. Uh, Isaiah 57, verses 18 and 19. So if you jump over there, in your Bibles. We have to answer the question here that I've brought up earlier, and that is we have to identify what the pronouns are referring to when we come across a text that's talking about you or him or her or they or them. And in this case, the text is talking about him, and it's giving promises to him. Uh, and so, if we, if we come in here and read just verses 18 and 19 to begin from Isaiah 57, prophecy goes like this. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners, creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord. I will heal him. Right, when we come across a beautiful promise of restoration and healing, a promise that says no matter how far or close you are, I will lead you, I will heal you. When you come across a promise like that, it's really important to see if you 
are the person who's received that promise? Do you fit into the him or the you or the them that God is promising to? Right, so that's why I asked the question, and, and you can answer it for me here. Whom does God say that He'll revive in Isaiah 57, verse 15? The contrite of heart. Right? And there's maybe a word we don't use that often, but those who repent those who recognize they've done it wrong, who are humble in spirit, yeah, he says, I will revive the heart of the contrite. That's what he says in verse 15. And then by the time you get to, you know, speaking of how God will heal him in verse 18, you're still talking about that same type of person from verse 15. It's the humble and the repentant person that God says He will revive. Right? There's references, if you look at verse 17, to because of the iniquity of His unjust gain, I was angry and struck Him. I hid my face and was angry, and He went on turning away in the way of His heart. Right? God here is speaking of Israel as a whole who turned away from him, rejected him, and so he stepped in and he was angry and he punished them and he sent them off into exile. They faced the consequences of their sin. But then God here is promising restoration. But it's interesting because it's not a blanket promise uh, for, for all Israelites. Right? That's the second question I ask you in your notes. So who do the following words of comfort apply to well, it's not just, okay, yes, all, all of Israel is punished, but not all of them are promised this restoration. It's only a group of Israelites who truly repent of their sin after being disciplined for it. So it's a subset of Israelites who do repent for their sin after God has stepped in to discipline them. This is important. There's discussions out there and comments that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, this is a promise that God's still going to fulfill because He made it to all of Israel, and somewhere even in our future, all of Israel is going to come back, be restored, healed, and kind of like one grand moment of, of, of salvation. But this promise can't be used in that way. This is referring to a specific group of folks that really got it after they were punished in exile and do, in fact, Repent, and it's not just anyone or everyone or all of the Jews, it's only those who meet these requirements of being contrite of heart, humble in spirit, you know, acknowledging their sin, coming back. Romans 8 28. Let's change to a passage that you are much more familiar with, most likely. Uh, this is a verse that gets thrown around all the time. <clears throat> When do you uh, generally hear someone using this verse, quoting this verse, or when, and in what situations in life do you think of, okay, this is a good time to quote Romans 8, 28? When someone's beat down? When they're suffering from illness or a family member dying, a lot of times. Yeah. 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 So grief or uh, physical suffering. Right? That's when we share the words, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Right? Normally, it's when things are going bad. It makes sense to most of us that we'd step in and say, well, God will cause all things to work together for good. Well, what's the answer to the first question I've asked you there in your notes? What topic is under discussion if you read the previous 10 verses in Romans chapter 8? Suffering. To take this question one step further, what's Paul saying about suffering? Suffering. 
Okay, so it may look bad, but there's a whole, comparatively, a, a lot better stuff to come there in verse 17. Okay, you're, you're going to deal with some frustrations because the world is broken, but there is hope to come. Let me ask the question a little more specifically. Is Paul's teaching in the run-up to verse 28 saying that here's how God will take away your suffering right now? Or here's how to deal with your suffering right now? Right. It's the latter. But the context is how to deal with the difficulties of life in a broken world before God starts the new one. Right? He talks about, you know, this, this comes up, verse 21, the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption. But it's not yet. Right? Uh, verse 23, we're waiting eagerly for the redemption of our body. But it's got some problems now. Right? Verse 26 is talking about how we don't even know how to pray to deal with all these problems. So the Spirit helps us out. So when you get to verse 28... It's important to ask the next question there in your notes. Does God's promise to work all things out for good mean we should experience a trouble-free life? <laughs> Most of you are like, it better not, or I'm doing something wrong. Um, the context says no. Uh, the, 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 the assumption is the world is broken, and it's tough, and you suffer from it, the world as a whole has got issues. Sin has just messed things up. Individually with my body, it's falling apart. I mean, so, so this is the, the world you, you live in. Bad things will happen to everyone, including whatever type of person you are in a broken world. So what is the good that God is working out? Salvation, I heard it over here. And sanctification, right? Throw them both in there. And that's, and that's absolutely right. Even if you look in uh, how the, uh, how the f passage flows, right? We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. There is a goal that God has with all the people that he has chased after to know. There is an original destiny that he has, and that is to be conformed to the image of his son. Sanctification is the word we used up here. So what is part of this good that God is working out? He's shaping who you are through the sufferings you endure. When you read Romans, you'll realize that Paul is actually coming back to this topic after first bringing it up at the beginning of chapter 5. If you go back there, he's, maybe it's easier to understand in terms of the way he explains it. Romans 5, verse 3, he says... Not only this, okay, well, it's like, well, not only, what, 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 what was this? We need to know, you know, just, don't just jump into a passage. I don't know what this is. Well, right before it, he said, we obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. So there, so the this is, well, yeah, because of what Christ has done, for those of us who believe Okay, we, we, we now stand in this grace and have this great hope of, of the glory that is to come. So kind of this, this, this ultimate salvation is secured because of the grace of God for those of us who are holding on to them. 
trusting Him for it. So he's like, that's a great thing. That's an awesome thing. But not only this, check out what else is going on in the here and now with what God's doing in the world. But we also exult in our tribulations, our problems, our difficulties, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. So same message of, yes, there is the salvation which God is working towards in all of our lives. He's going to take us there. Those of us who have been called according to His purpose and who have responded in love, as Romans 8.28 says, just like Romans 5.2 says, but not only is the good that God is working out the fact of your ultimate salvation, but in the here and now, it's the formation of your character. As Romans 5.3 says quite explicitly there uh, as you move into Romans 5, chapter 4. So, the good that God is working out is good, but it might not be how we normally define it. Because we would think of good as stuff that's easy for me, stuff that I want to have happen, you know, the lack of bad things in my life occurring. That's what good is. Well, not in God's economy here. So God is working out the good in the sense of He's forming your character and will ultimately move you down the road <clears throat> to this amazing life to come in glory. And that's the same thing we read if you go back to Romans chapter 8 and go beyond verse 29 to verse 30 where it says, those whom He predestined, he also called, those whom He called, He also justified, and those whom He justified, He also glorified. Kind of a strange tense to use that yes, He has already glorified you. Uh, he has already ushered you into the glory of God that is to come. It's, it's a future experience for you, but it's a guaranteed fact in God's economy. And, 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 and so, uh, again, this is the ultimate good that God works out for those who love Him. You have that good that is coming, and He will not fail along the way. I mean, you might choose to do whatever you do, but uh, He will not fail along the way. And so you can know God is working out that good. You know, but, you know think about what that you know, means. Right? We shouldn't be using this verse in situations where someone's dealing with a lot of trouble to say, hey, God's going to get you out of it. We use it to say, no, God's going to form you in the midst of it. And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this is normal. This is the normal part of the story of the whole of the Bible. You know, go back to Isaiah. and I mean, you know, God will talk about, I'm going to bring you through the fire. He doesn't say, I'm going to get you out of the fire. I'm going to bring you through the fire. And, and again, this is, you know, language of a refiner's fire, a purifying process. I mean, this is normal. We'll talk a little bit more about it. It shows that, you know, 1 Peter 4, suffering has all these great benefits in terms of how it forms us. And for many of us who are praying and seeking all the time to get out of difficulties, what we're unknowingly doing is trying to avoid being conformed to the image of Christ through the way in which God does it. I, I remember when this, this came up, I was once asked, I was on a, uh, a retreat with a bunch of uh, other leaders, college leaders, when I was in uh, college. And, um, you know, we were meeting, talking about what we were doing, uh, ministry with the student body and different stuff. And then it was, came to a close, and it was time for the first group to go home and take one of the vans, because some people needed to get back to study and all this stuff. And so they said, let's pray for them and send them out. And so they're like, Paul, will you pray? And I said, sure. Right, and, 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 you know, what are you normally expecting at that point? Right, you're supposed to say something about traveling mercies? That's not what I prayed. I prayed, God, if you want to break this van down anywhere between here and our college so that they can learn who you are or minister to someone else, do it. 
They, they didn't ask me to pray after that. It wasn't a, I never, I don't know. Yeah, I was like, did I, what did I do? But right, it, the goal is not to get God to agree what's good for us based on what we think it is. It's for us to get on board with God. And if he says, hey, man, you're going to learn a lot through really difficult times, well, then we've got to learn to embrace them, not be afraid of them, not try to escape them. You know, God is, God is not our out. Okay, he's our with in the midst of it.